Welcome to episode 117 of the Headspace and Timing podcast. I'm honored and appreciative to be able to have a conversation with best-selling author, filmmaker, journalist, and veteran advocate Sebastian Younger. You know, I talked to a young woman after I gave a talk. This young woman came up to me and she said that she was a, a cancer survivor and that she'd spent quite a long time on a cancer ward with other people who had cancer, and she was one of the lucky ones, like she survived. And she gave me the saddest look, and she said, now I miss being sick, which she missed the community of those people, and half of them were going to die. And she didn't know if she was going to be one of them. She still missed it. So people need community. And when you take someone out of a platoon, maybe they're in a support unit, maybe they never got shot at, never, nothing happened, right? But you take them out of that platoon, and you put them back down to society, they're going to struggle. They're humans. We're wired to be with others. And when, once we've been exposed to that, and then it's taken away. It's very, very hard to maintain a, uh, a psychological health. Before we kick off the interview, I'd like to bring you a quick message from Dr. Barbara Van Dalen, founder and president of Given Hour, about an event that's coming up June 9th through the 15th. I'm Dr. Barbara Van Dalen, founder and president of Given Hour and the Campaign to Change Direction. We want everyone to join us the second week of June for a week to change direction and the Change Direction Jam. Together, we're changing the culture of mental health. Events during the week can happen anywhere and everywhere. We're so excited to work with IBM to create this global discussion. Mark your calendar, register, and join us to Change Direction. Go to changedirection.org. That's changedirection.org to learn more. Here at Headspace and Timing, we'll be joining Given Hour during that week. The podcast episode that week will be with Dr. Van Dalen, and that week's blog post is going to focus on the campaign to change direction. Longtime listeners will know that our mission is to change the way that we think and talk about federal mental health, and the campaign to change direction is doing exactly that. Make sure to check them out at changedirection.org. Welcome to the Headspace and Timing podcast, a show dedicated to breaking down the stereotypes around veteran mental health. My name is Dwayne France, and I'm a retired Army non-commissioned officer and a combat veteran of both Iraq and Afghanistan. After retiring from the Army, I took on a new mission as a clinical mental health counselor for my fellow service members. If you served in any branch of the military, then you're familiar with the M2 machine gun, the 50 cal. It's one of the most effective weapons in the military's arsenal. If the weapon's headspace and timing wasn't set correctly, however, it was just a useless chunk of metal. Veterans can be rendered inoperable if their headspace and timing is not set correctly either. That's my goal with this show, to change the way that we think and talk about veteran mental health and reduce the stigma against seeking support. Each week, we'll talk with mental health professionals, veterans, and those who support service members, veterans, and their families. We're going to have real and honest conversations about a topic that most just don't like to talk about, veteran mental health. Let's jump into this week's conversation. For a lot of veterans and, and even mental health providers who listen to the show, um, uh, we often say a man who needs no introduction, but well, there you go. Okay, thank you. So yeah, um, really, one, I, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to come on the show to talk. Um, as you probably hear very often, um, the work that you've done, not just with Tribe most recently, but with um, uh, Restrepo and, and things like that, um, is, is very well respected in the veteran community. And uh, just having the opportunity to come on and share your thoughts about sort of mental health and mental wellness, it's really appreciated. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks for saying that. So I, I, I'd like to really start with Tribe, right? A lot of, um, uh, a lot of veterans, uh, I as a mental health professional, I have my clients read it and, and things like that. Um, uh, it really rings true to a lot of veterans. Is that something that you've, uh, you've kind of heard? Yeah, I have heard that quite a bit, actually. Uh, and more and more, it's interesting that the, the book, you know, it did pretty well when it came out, but it wasn't... Uh, um, earth shattering and, and its performance. But then since then, it just has quietly sort of kept seeping into the, um, into the culture, uh, including into military culture, I think, uh, but even more broadly with civilians, like it's, it's people are, I, I, I think reading it more and more. And, and I think for most people, it resonates pretty uh, deeply. And for you being that bridge, right, being the, the one that uh, sort of takes the stories back, obviously as a journalist, it's what you did uh, and what you do. Um, 
and, and not being a veteran yourself, uh, I'd actually had a colleague of mine is interested. Uh, how did you get into the tribe of veterans, even going as far back as, as the Korengal and things like that? But but how did uh, someone who had never served be someone who was accepted so much in the veteran community? Well, I'm a journalist, and you know that the job requires that you um, uh, gain entry into other people's worlds. Uh, it's not just soldiers, you know. If you're going to do something about firemen, you got to do that with firemen. If you're going to, if you're going to cover the Civil War in Sierra Leone, as I did in 2000s, and you're going to cover the combat, you're going to have to manage to to um, attach yourself to militia groups that were fighting that war. I mean, that's just what journalism is. So, um, uh, humans are human, soldiers are human. Like you get the new kid in school at first, and then eventually they get to know you, you know, and so, I mean, it's just, it's, it, there's nothing unique about being a, a journalist with soldiers. Um, it's the same, it's the same problem that any newcomer in a, in a group with a high solidarity, it's, it's the problem that any newcomer has in a situation like that. Right, and that high solidarity is, is a barrier to many. As you said, if, if civilians or those who haven't served are reading tribe, it's sort of a look into um, the mindset, uh, the solidarity mindset of uh, of the veteran and military community. Yeah, and 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 I think um, as far as being covering combat, you know, once you sort of show that you're a decent person, that you're likable, that you're going to be fair in your in your work, like I think most soldiers will are pretty nice to most journalists and willing to open up to them. Um, and as far as sort of the veterans and, and civilians, you know, I think in some ways. I mean, there there are profound differences between veterans and civilians, but there's but there are far more similarities. And um, you know, I think there is a sort of, in some ways, a false construct of you know you could never understand what I went through, and or a civilian saying I can I can't imagine what you went through saying that to a veteran. I mean, actually, you can imagine that. You know what I mean? Like there are there is a basis for trying to imagine an experience. Um, I have a two-year-old. You know, I'll never know what it's like to give birth. But you know what? I, I I can come pretty close to imagining it in some ways because there's great communication often between men and women around the topic of birth, right? As there should be. You know, and likewise, if um, veterans and civilians talk and listen to each other, I think you can get 95% of the way there in terms of sort of understanding the experience and the concerns of the other group. And that part of my work with Restrepo and with War and with Tribe is to actually... Um, try to facilitate that conversation, but it has to go in both directions. Actually, I mean, I, I mean, I would love to hear a veteran say, you know, I can't imagine what it's like to be a civilian. I'd like to hear more from you about what that's like. You know, I'd love to hear that question as well. Yeah, you're right. It, it doesn't go both ways, and and I agree. The idea of um, the gap, if if everybody sits on their um, respective. Uh, their respective sides and, and don't actually, you know, reach into that gap, then, then they're never going to get that. And, and for, you know, it, this idea about being a facilitator in between, um, in my experience as a veteran and, and as a mental health professional, veterans want their stories told. Um, there's this paradox that, that we experience is we really want people to understand um, what we went through. And at the same time, we don't know how to, or, or you know, somebody's not going to be able to drag it out of us with the team of horses, um, and and that's another thing that I get that you facilitate is allowing veterans to tell their story in a, a safe and easy way. Right. I mean, that's a societal, that's a societal problem, and it's not just with veterans. I mean, I think, I mean, we live in a very complex modern society, and all of us depend on the hard and sometimes dangerous work of groups of other people that we'll never know. I mean, we all drive cars. The people that drill oil out of the ground are doing something incredibly nasty and dangerous. Uh, I don't know any oil workers, right? You know, like I live in a house made of wood. I don't know any loggers, you know, and that's true for most people. And so I think, and, you know, veterans, I think, are the most extreme and visible example of that gap. But, you know, we live in a society where all the people we depend on rely on. Um, we, we know for, for the physical nature of our existence, for our physical lives, for our safety, for our comfort, all those people <laughs> rely on in those industries, like we don't know any of them. And uh, most people don't know any of those people. So, you know, I think there's a societal problem of communication. And in a simpler tribal society, of course, you would know the buffalo hunter, you would know the guy that, you know, tans hides, you would know the whatever. I mean, all those, all those, um, uh, sort of micro industries within a small scale tribal society, all those people would be known by everybody and valued by everybody. 
that's not the case for us. So back to your question, like how do you how do you facilitate a conversation between groups of people? My idea, which is in my book Tribe, is that you have something called the Veterans Town Hall, where every Veterans Day, you know, have the parade or don't have the parade. It doesn't really matter in some ways, but but definitely open up the door of the town hall, of the city hall, turn on the PA system, and 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 you know, my proposal, and we've done this, and it works very well, is to have you know any veteran, any invitation of any veteran of any war has the right to speak for ten minutes. Uh, to the citizenry that hopefully will gather to hear them. And that's a very, very powerful, extremely powerful and affecting um, experience, I think, for veterans and for the audience as well. You know, I I like how you bring up this idea of isolation um, from those that... uh... Um, that support us, right? You know, and um, had another guest on the show. Uh, the military is not about uh, killing and destroying things; about preserve and protect, right? And um, overseas, of course, law enforcement. Uh, but in in America, right, in in the United States, there is a mental health crisis, and two of the the largest. Um, uh, epidemics of suicide are happening in the construction workers and farmers. Um, again, both. Um, sorts of industries that provide support for the rest of the nation, but are, are extremely isolated. Um, it, it, does that get to this sense of uh, a, a lack of tribalism leads to isolation and marginalization? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I didn't know that about construction workers and farmers. Um, uh, the, uh, the construction workers, I mean, my experience with them is that they work in a pretty tight group farming. And that's an isolating, that's a very isolated, uh, kind of work i think like dentistry also has very high suicide rates because it's very it's very solitary there isn't a lot of sort of group uh group dynamic group interaction which is something that's extremely healthy for people so um the suicide rate is complicated and uh and it's it, it's determined by an awful lot of factors it's sort of hard to isolate the one thing that's driving it but what we do know broadly and there are plenty of exceptions but what we do know is that affluence goes up in the society the suicide rate tends to go up the depression rate tends to go up. The addiction rates tend to go up. Affluence, that has so many benefits, of course, um, also brings with it some psychological stresses that are very, very counterintuitive. Right. And, and uh, that, that goes to another concept that you had um, identified in Tribe, and there's been a lot of discussion, is that the, the prevalence rates of post-traumatic stress disorder um, in that which is um, you know, being supported by the VA, they're very different, right? You know, in, in disability, um, but mental health um, goes beyond just PTSD. But that's what we're focusing on. But this affluence in our society, um, you know, it brings the separation. And as you said, this this idea of of depression and, and anxiety. Um, but also, when we were all working together as a team, whether it be in Afghanistan or or in a tribal society, there was really no concern about purpose and meaning, right? We we all sort of knew what the purpose and meaning was. But the more affluent that 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 I seem to to understand, the more affluent we get, the more we have to seek or create purpose and meaning because it's not really there; it's been removed. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you when you use technology to sort of like take care of most most of the processes that keep you alive um you what you lose is the the need to belong to a group and i mean at a very sort of like simple level survival in the natural world like humans a a human alone in the natural world dies almost immediately um we only survive in groups and i think it's very ingrained in us that if you're, you're not in a group and you're not doing something for that group your safety, your physical safety, uh, is really in question, and um, and your safety, your physical safety, and therefore your emotional safety, comes from inclusion in a group, and inclusion in a group that you're necessary to. Well, I mean, the, the the more necessary you are to that group, the more secure your place is in it. And so, when you have someone who's, um, I. Not who who's not necessary, right? So you know, someone who's retired who lost their job, someone who has enough PTSD disability benefits to not have to work, for example. Like what you're doing is you're basically saying we don't, you know, society doesn't need you. We're good. Just do your own thing. We're good. And in a very ancient, deep human sense, when someone says we don't need you, you're good. You're not good. That's the opposite of good. That means you're in a lot of danger, and that you your survival is in question. So. Um, 
obviously, I think people who are really deeply traumatized and not functional at all need to be supported financially in all kinds of other ways. But I think there's a lot of sort of gray area where people were affected by the war. But you know, they 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 could be uh, functional if 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 they wanted to be, if the state told them that they they had to be, like. Like you gotta, what we're gonna help you, but you gotta help us. You know, you need to find work. We're gonna train you. Whatever that reciprocal arrangement with society, where every person puts in, right? Um, that's incredibly important. You could argue that soldiers did put in, and that they and that they've done their duty to the society. That's fine. That's fine with me. I just think you're not doing the, the veterans a favor by warehousing them with that. You're, it sounds like you're being nice, but actually I think you're doing something that's very dangerous to anyone's mental health. Right. And, you know, and, and that's where I have these conversations a lot with the, the veterans I work with. Not all of the veterans that I see as a mental health counselor have PTSD, uh, just because it doesn't have the prevalence rate that many people think it does. But nearly all of them are struggling with meaning and purpose. And having that conversation with a veteran who's 27 years old, who has all their basic needs met, you know, monetarily, safety wise, they've got a house and things. Um, and then it's, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? What are you going to do for the next 40 years? Is it, you know, sit home and watch TV? And, and exactly like you said, and then that causes veterans, I believe, to, to then look back to, um, to combat is the best thing in, in their lives. And I wish I could go back and sort of, they're just on the shelf waiting for another war. Absolutely. And so, so would you want to create a sort of depressed alcoholic uh, or a depressed non-functional person, like give them enough money to survive so that they don't have to work, but no tasks and duties to perform where they can feel valued and necessary and walk away. And, 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 and of course those people are going to be, become depressed, right? Of course they are. And then the depression gets called PTSD. So now you've got a word for it. And, um, uh, and, and in that way, people are, you know, I think, unfortunately, perversely, people are sort of incentivized to see themselves as broken. You know, first of all, they're depressed, but their depression is a very healthy reaction to the circumstances they're in. And then secondly, there is there is a financial incentive and a and a um, also a sort of personal incentive. Uh, I mean, PTSD means you've been in combat. It means you've served honorably. It means you've sacrificed for this country. It means all of these things that society has uh, values, right? Uh, and and so there's a lot of perverse incentives to actually sort of remain quote broken. Um, and I, you know I think what um, society has to do, veterans have to do, is look to um, there's an amazing painting. I think it's a real sort of paradigm for a healthy relationship with society, one that we could do for every, not just veterans, for everybody. Is um, it's a painting. Uh, by is it Winslow Homer? I think it's Winslow Homer. It shows it, it, um, it shows a uh, it's called a, a a veteran in new fields, and it uh, it shows a guy, a young man. It's right after painted right after the Civil War, 1865, and it shows a young man um, with a scythe harvesting wheat. You know, it's like a wheat field in Pennsylvania, maybe something like that. It was clearly, a former Union soldier. His gear is piled in one corner of the painting, and. He's, he's harvesting wheat. You know, basically, this guy came home from the from the war, right? His community said, look, well done on the war. We still need you. We need to get the wheat in. It's, you know, it's fall, right? Uh, here's the scythe, you know, like, get to it. And that, and that may seem heartless, but actually, I think it's an enormously healthy thing to do to ask people to continue participating in society. Um, that, that's, that promotes mental health. Um, Allowing people to not participate in society, I think, in a very, very real sense, leads to depression and even suicide. I think it's an extremely dangerous thing to do. You know, I really appreciate that. It's a, it's a great point. I'm thinking back as you're talking to how veterans uh, uh, reacted to, let's say, um, uh, coming back from combat. We don't talk about them very often, but World War I, uh, they came back and there was the lost generation. Of course, there was the Depression and um, uh, some really difficult times um, there and, and, and had, you know, not had the 
sort of the greatest generation vibe that World War II generation had, um, they came back and went to work, right? Because so many of, you know, the, and, um, and I've said it before on the show, not just presidents and lawyers and, you know, um, judges and things like, but my grandfathers, um, came back and one became a tailor and one became a mechanic, right? They came back and went to work in their community. Um, uh, Korean war, yes, there was draftees, but it was largely, um, you know, uh, the active military at the time. Uh, but then Vietnam, we got to the place where a lot of Vietnam veterans came back and, and felt this disenfranchisement um, and, and just sort of, and does that pattern seem to hold true? Yeah. I mean, I think in a traditional tribal society, there isn't even a question of whether the returning warriors are going to go back to work or not. Of course they are. Right. Like it's not even a question. And, and, uh, and, and in this society, um, the, the, the wartime generations that were able to come back and go and go back to work, I think we're very, very fortunate. Um, and uh, the ones that didn't, and I'm including the, the current generation of veterans, uh, for economic reasons or, or, or social reasons. I mean, there is now a sort of like in our society an idea that veterans are broken and that and then they serve their country and they shouldn't have to serve their country any longer. And here's a you know a disability check check for the nation, thirty two hundred dollars a month isn't a lot of money, right? We can afford, we can afford to sort of warehouse these people and take care of them and forget about them. I think it's terrible for the veterans that are getting these payments, unless, you know, except for the ones that are really, truly are psychologically broken and need, they really need that support. But I think a lot of them could work their way out of it. I mean, PTSD for 80% of people, PTSD is a, um, is a condition that resolves itself over time. I mean, I've had it. Most people in their lives will be traumatized and will eventually get over it. The idea that it's like a permanent state, psychological state for the rest of your life is, you know, for 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 eighty percent of of humans, that that's not true. Um, and we don't want to incentivize people to think it is true. It's bad for them. And um, yeah, I, I, you know, there's I, there's an interesting statistic. After nine eleven in New York, I live in New York City, and after nine eleven, the suicide rate went down in New York City, right? In other words, mental health sort of improved. And, and, and the theory was that New Yorkers suddenly felt united, like, oh, we're all in this together. When people feel united, they're psychologically healthier. But another interesting thing is that Vietnam veterans in New York City who were suffering from PTSD uh, said that their symptoms went away. Many of them said their symptoms went away after the attacks. Think about that. It didn't re-traumatize them. It re-energized them. Like, oh, my country needs me again. We're all in this together. Let's get let's get it done, right? And and so that to me is a really really revealing statistic about how people respond to crisis and, and to what degree they really need to be part of the group. Right, and it goes back to that idea of um, you know you're sitting on a shelf or you're in a glass box and breaking case of war, and and arguably, especially um, at Ground Zero and. Um, and, and even I, I heard the same thing, you know, in response to the Pentagon um, in, in D.C. Um, that, uh, you know, <laughs> take me off the shelf and put me back in the game. And so it's, it's this, you know, it, to mix metaphors, um, you know, the soldiers have been benched until it's time to, you know, to hit the game winning shot at the buzzer. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, people are just dying to be needed to be used. Uh, and um, and. We are an affluent, mechanized society to such a degree that, that we actually, you know, don't need everybody in some way. We can afford to have, to carry an, an enormous number of, of, of young men and women, like carry them, provide for them, and not need, not require input from them. Uh, I mean, that's a wealthy society that can afford to do that. I mean, you take the Sioux or the Cheyenne or the Apache or whatever, uh, before the reservation days, and you said, "Okay, we're we're gonna like take we're gonna take some percentage of your young men and young women off the playing field. See how you get see how you get along." They'd laugh at you. They're like, "We can't survive like that. We need everybody, you know." And that's the you know, I mean, that, you know, it's this irony of modern society is is our our affluence is such a great blessing, but it also comes with these human costs, these, these downsides that often don't get taken into account. Right. And, and it's these um, these deeper needs, the need to be connected, the need to be, you know, felt worthy and, and be a part of society. Uh, there's um, there, there's actually an excerpt 
out of tribe um, that I'd like to touch on briefly. Uh, you said that humans are so strongly wired to help one another and enjoy such enormous social benefits from doing so that people regularly risk their lives for complete strangers. Um, and, and when I read that, my thought was, well, what happens when there's no longer a social benefit to doing that? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think there were, you know, in the case of a um, of an emergency, like an emergency on the street, right? Someone's shooting, the building's on fire, whatever it is. I think people that spring into action and help those in danger will always be sort of rewarded in social terms, will be rewarded, will be honored, will be admired. I mean, I think that's just so deeply human that it will always be true. Um, but in a more um, mundane sense, uh, the, going back to the people we all depend on, uh, the people that drill for oil, the people that cut down the trees, the people that teach our children at schools. I mean, you know, I mean, these very, very basic services that every society needs to make happen. You know, are we really valuing the input of those people? Not really. You know, uh, I mean, sometimes in sort of lip service, we certainly don't compensate them as if we value them. That's for damn sure. You know, um, so I like. You know, the, capitalism incentivizes other industries and rewards other industries with money and not school teaching. But, you know, really, if you wipe, if you took out all the school teachers, our civilization would be over within a generation. I mean, seriously, think about that. If you just wiped out all teachers, like within a generation, our society would be over, you know, and, and they're some of the most poorly paid people in the country. Like, it's insane. Right. And, and that's the, the idea of um, in just that sacrifice, because it is a sacrifice. My daughter is a, uh, a freshman in, in college and wants to be a um, early elementary school teacher. And I'm like, well, it's and it is a sacrifice. I, I work very closely with my, my kids school. And, um, you know, you would I'm trying to get her to be a child psychologist and she doesn't want to do that. Right. Because it pays a little bit better. And, and, and there is this idea of, of it's just sort of people working in the background and this idea of um, thinking of, of our soldiers and, and service members. And as they're defending the nation in whatever way and however they're doing that um, it's not as visible as, you know, the, the burning car that somebody breaks a window. I mean, it's not as immediate. It's not, it's not as aware. And so, um, the more we're separated from the act of sacrifice, the less meaningful it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, like we, don't, I mean, we're, we're humans and we, we, the things that we witness that are near us make a depression and the distant things don't. So, th so there's very good, there's, you know, there's very good human reasons for why guys are drilled for oil. It is mostly young, young men or it is, it is mostly men. Why the guys who drill for oil aren't being recognized and honored by, People in New York City, you know, it's so far away, you know, it's like, whatever, like, the, you know, you pump the oil out of the gas station, you know, that's how you get it. Like, they don't, we don't think about that sort of chain of supply, but we don't do that about anything. And, and it's, uh, it's the cost we pay for a modern society, and there's a lot of benefits, but we could stop and at least in our mind make a mental experiment of, well, all the stuff I count on, how did it get here? Um and, uh, you know, how, like, who is taking care of me? Wow, all these people. You know, in, the, in these industries, I should say, a lot of these industries, logging, uh, oil, oil development, all these commercial fishing, like, these industries have, have mortality rates comparable to combat units. Uh, uh, maybe not frontline combat units, but whatever, you know, military units in a war zone, you know, like, absolutely comparable. And, uh, you know, no one's, no one's thinking about it. Right. And, you know, and of course, you know, whether we're the, the genies out of the bottle and, and trying to, you know, create the whole, um, you know, getting back to a tribal society, you know, it's, it's highly unlikely. But but your efforts are at least to um, to highlight how this is impacting our returning veterans. It's a it's a thesis on it's not just PTSD. Um, it's something more than just PTSD. And we as a nation have a responsibility to one, be aware of it, and then do what we can to um, to address it. And at least for veterans, it's that idea of the town hall. Right, right. And I, you know, the thing about the thing about PTSD is like only something like ten percent of the U.S. military is like actively engaged in combat and in a, and in a position to be repeatedly traumatized. And and but an enormous number of people are vulnerable to depression when they come home. Right. I mean, one quarter of Peace Corps volunteers. 
um, really struggle with depression when they come back to this country. And so what we have to do is remove psychological stress from trauma. So if you take someone who's in a support unit and they really truly are struggling with depression when they get back to this country, what you don't want to do is try to convince them they have PTSD because that's the only word you have for a veteran who's struggling. Right? You really don't want to do that because they're going to have to invent or reimagine some incident that actually wasn't that traumatic and they're going to have to reimagine it as a central traumatizing moment in their life, but it actually wasn't. Don't make, you know, don't, don't make those, these people exaggerate. You know, like, if you had another term for it, like post-deployment transition disorder or something that was actually more honest and applied, uh, and actually applied to the, the majority of veterans, um, non-combat veterans, uh, if you had a term like that, it would sort of let everyone off the hook. Like, okay, you're really, you really are struggling. You just weren't in combat, but you don't need to have been in combat to be struggling with the transition from a close, very tightly bonded unit that you function with for a year, like shoulder to shoulder, you know, like doing everything together. That's a deeply human experience. And then you're going from that to now you're living in a single family home in a cul-de-sac outside St. Louis. Like, I, and you're, and you're struggling with that. Of course you are, right? You don't need the trauma. That is totally ex- explained. That, that, that change of circumstances easily explains depression. And so I think there needs to be a paradigm shift shift in the therapeutic community about sorting out what, you know, what really, not exaggerating trauma when there's a very, there's another explanation that easily explains some of the struggles that veterans go through who actually weren't getting shot at. Right. And, and you know, and, and that's a great point, this idea of, um, you know, whether you're exposed to trauma or not, but it goes beyond, you know, just PTSD or TBI. And you gave the example of the Peace Corps volunteers, and it put me um, in mind of uh, uh, Michael Phelps uh, several years ago discussed how severely depressed and, and literally suicidal he was um, after, I think it was the Rio uh, Olympics. Um, uh, we just recently had um, uh, Kelly Caitlin, who is a, um, you know, gold or a medal winning Olympian, um, 23 years old, took her own life. Um, and, and so these ideas of merging vets and players is an organization. We had Jacob Toops on the show um, where what you're talking about is this extremely close knit you know, a group of individuals working towards a common goal. Professional athletes feel the same way when they leave um, uh, what they're doing. Um, And there are similarities and neither Olympians nor professional athletes arguably um, experience the trauma that veterans have, but still have the same non PTSD challenges. Oh, it's a terrible problem. I know with the NFL, I've talked to them about it. I'm people retiring out of the sport and, uh, uh, I mean, and I'll go you one better. I mean, I, you know, I talked to a young woman after I gave a talk, this young woman came up to me and she said that she was a, a cancer survivor and that she'd spent quite a long time on a cancer ward with other people who had cancer. And she was one of the lucky ones. Like she survived. And, and she gave me the saddest look and she said, now I miss being sick, which she missed the community of those people. And half of them were going to die. And she didn't know if she was going to be one of them. She still missed it. You know? So, um, yeah, people need community, you know, and when you take someone out of a platoon, maybe they're in a support unit, maybe they never got shot at, never, nothing happened, right? But you take them out of that platoon and you put them back down to society, uh, they're going to they're gonna struggle. They're humans. We're wired to be with others. And when, once we've been exposed to that, and then it's taken away, it's very, very hard to maintain a uh, you know, psychological health, I think. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Um, I know this is something that, that you talk about very often and, and definitely could talk about all day. I definitely want to be respectful of your time. And, um, any last thoughts you think you'd like to, to leave to the listeners? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think this conversation about mental health and veterans and suicide and all that is very, very important. But what I would say is that it's not just veterans. Like, these issues apply to everybody. You don't have to have been deployed to be struggling from the exact same thing that veterans struggle with. We all live in an alienated society. You can see the cost in psychological terms. You can see the cost, you know, in every direction that you look, in the suicide rate, the addiction rate, the depression rate, uh, the PTSD rates, for that matter, uh, are very high in affluent societies and much lower in poor societies. Uh, I and mean, we, can, we can see this 
everywhere and it affects everyone. And, and what, you know, what I would say is that on an individual level, if you proactively try to establish um, healthy group dynamics in your neighborhood, for example, I mean, you're like it or not, your tribe or the people that live around you, you know, I mean, and that's just, we're just stuck with that. Right. So, you know, actively try to establish healthy, like rich, ongoing daily relationships with people around you where you feel needed. They, they need you. And also at the sort of macro scale, um, uh, you know, I think, and I know this is a so hot button issue, but I'm going to say it anyway, it, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, the partisan divide in this country is, is, is a, a macro scale, another example of the splitting off of people from each other. And uh, it really, it, it's a threat to our country. Al Qaeda is not a threat to our country. You know, ISIS is not, a, they, they, you know, they really can't touch us essentially, uh, not in a meaningful way that would take down the country. But we could take down our own country with this, with this nonsense that's going on. And I think for veterans, for everybody, if you really want to talk about tribe and community, it goes from, you know, it goes all the way from your street corner all the way on up to the White House and Congress. And we have to work on all of it to live in a better society. And, that, and we deserve that. You know, I, I, I definitely agree with you. Um, we have met the enemy and he is us, right? I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. Um, a very busy schedule, as um, as is absolutely warranted, and and um, just and and you probably hear it fairly often. But uh, from one veteran um, to you and the work that you've done, um, I really appreciate it. Um, it's used. Um, uh, it, it's used by me as a mental health professional to help open the aperture of some of the uh, the veterans' eyes to say, look, you. You need to go find your tribe. You need to be connected to something. So um, thanks not just for coming on the show today, but also for the work you're doing. It's, it's greatly appreciated. I, I really enjoy talking to you, and thank you for your work with veterans. Uh, it, you know, it's all super important, and eventually we'll all get there, but uh, it's because of good people like you. So, so thank you. I, I, I'd be happy to talk to you anytime. You're listening to Headspace and Timing, where we're trying to change the way that we think and talk about veteran mental health. I continue to be appreciative of the fact that we're having a real and honest discussion about veteran mental health in our communities. As I mentioned in the show, many veterans I talk to find Younger's book, Tribe, describes exactly how they feel when they get back from combat or leave the military. Younger's idea of having a veteran town hall meeting on Memorial Day is a good one. Any veteran from any era has 10 minutes to talk about whatever they want to talk about. Ran against the war? Go ahead. Talk about how great the Army was in the 80s? Have at it. If a service member served a year in the military, then they deserve 10 minutes to tell others what they feel about it. In many ways, this is what I'm trying to do here. Capture the stories of veterans and those who serve and support them. Sure, we may take more than 10 minutes, but being able to bring the information about the psychological impact of military service to those who want to hear it is very important. Will every individual in the community show up for a veteran town hall? Probably not. Will everyone listen to these episodes? Also unlikely, but the fact is that they're here for folks to check out. Thanks for taking the time to listen. If you want to find the show notes for this episode, go to VeteranMentalHealth.com forward slash HST117. If you want to show your support for the show, make sure to leave an honest rating or review on the podcast platform you're using. We're always looking for guests, either veterans or those who support them. You can drop me a line at info at VeteranMentalHealth.com to recommend guests, or you can go to VeteranMentalHealth.com forward slash guest to fill out a suggestion or request. Our thanks this month go to Give an Hour and the Campaign to Change Direction. Don't forget we'll be joining them for the Week to Change Direction from June 9th through the 15th. If you want to see how you can, too, go to ChangeDirection.org. A Week to Change Direction will happen anywhere and everywhere people and organizations want to be part of this change. Give an Hour will provide toolkits with suggestions and ideas for how you or your organization can participate in a week to change direction, or you can create your own. Just a reminder that the guests and information on this show are for educational purposes only and not meant to be considered professional advice. Well, I'm a therapist, I'm not your therapist. If something you've heard makes you think that you should talk to somebody, then reach out to do so. I'd like to thank Doc Todd for giving us permission to use his track Not Alone from his album Combat Medicine. Doc's trying to bring the discussion about veteran mental health out of the darkness, and you can see all of his work at therealdoctod.com. Be on the lookout for another great episode, and until then, remember, veterans, you're not alone. Ever. The 
The struggle is real. Found a feast and lost a soul. Eventually, my drinking it got out of control. There in darkness, I roam, struggling to find home. See, suddenly, death didn't feel so alone. 22 a day, destination unknown. It could have been avoided if you picked up the phone. But now you're gone, so I guess all we get is the tone. Nothing but bone weeds, overgrown, pushing up stones. I've triumphed over enemies, co-creating enemies. Broke out facilities that try to put an end to me. R.I.P. I rather grind in tranquility. Authentic Tennessee, embrace my ability. From your forehead. It's time, man. You've been through enough pain. Stand up. It's time to stand back up. All my veterans, man, Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard. Get up, you know. Oh, I just 